I think we're almost 24 hours away from the inauguration of the 45th president of the United States. Where does he stand in an open society? Well, I have described him as, as a, an imposter and con man and, and a would-be dictator. President Trump is a con man and the ultimate narcissist who wants the world to revolve around him. We got through everything we got through. They gave us the Mueller hoax. They gave us the Russia, Russia, Russia crap. They get us the... One phone call that was a perfect phone call. Oh, let's get him out of office for that phone call. Clearly, I consider the Trump administration a danger to the world. But I regard it as a purely temporary phenomenon that will disappear in 2020 or even sooner. Those who are stirring it up, and they do, uh, many of them work for George Soros's uh, front organizations. When his fantasy of becoming president came true, his narcissism developed a pathological dimension. Everything that is broken today can be fixed, and every failure can be turned into a truly great success. George Soros is known for stirring up anti-government protests in other countries. And it looks like the upcoming Trump administration might see a few. Failing schools can become flourishing schools. Our school is falling apart, and we need people to help fix it. Crumbling roads and bridges can become gleaming new infrastructure. Inner cities can experience a flood of new jobs and investment, and rising crime can give way to safe and prosperous communities. All of these things and so much more are possible. But to accomplish them, we must replace the present policy of globalism. South Korea and the U.S. just updated their free trade agreement. Which have it just taken so many jobs out of our communities and so much wealth out of our country and replace it with a new policy of Americanism. The presidential campaign showed there is no love lost between Donald Trump and George Soros, who was one of Hillary Clinton's top donors. Howard, let me ask you, because you are a communications expert like I try to be, and talk about these code words. But this thing about globalist, I didn't know that was a code. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that Soros was particularly targeted because of his faith, his religion, his, his Jewishness. Let me start with my headline tonight. I'm retiring. This is the last hardball on MSNBC. And obviously, this isn't for lack of interest in politics. As you can tell, I've loved every minute of my 20 years as host of Hardball. And really, together, we're preserving this exceptional nation that our ancestors fought and died to build. We are making America greater than ever before. We really are. I think it's going to be greater than ever before with what we're doing with our military. And what we're doing also to get rid of very bad people. We have such bad people, and they're not, they're not people that love our country. We're getting people that really love our country, and it's so important. And if I wasn't able to fulfill that, no matter what other things we've done, I would not consider this journey to be a success. So just remember that. Human trafficking is believed to be one of the largest criminal activities in the world, with an estimated 24.9 million people trapped in forced labor, domestic servitude, or commercial sex trafficking. Um, and Epstein didn't kill himself. <laughs> okay, thank you for that commentary. All right. They are coming after me because I am fighting for you, and we are fighting for those who have no voice, and we will win because we know how to win. On Friday, President Trump falsely claimed protesters were not motivated by their concerns, but by paychecks 
from billionaire George Soros instead. Quote. Well, that's a very old, tired, anti-Semitic, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, very, very old anti-Semitic uh, <sighs> trick. It's just chaos all the time. I mean, and it seems like he's the, you know, the commander of the chaos. You know? We're exposing the corruption of the Washington Democrats and we're draining the Washington swamp. I just didn't know how dirty it would be. I didn't know how deep it would be. When I said drain the swamp for a long time, you know, I was given that expression. A speechwriter gave it to me, said drain the swamp. I said, that's so hokey. I said, that's, such, that's the worst. I don't want to use it. Anyway, it ends up in one of the speeches. I said, we will drain the swamp, right? The place went crazy. I said, let's try it again. And we did it again, and the place went crazy. Now, here's the bad part. I never knew. The swamp was so bad. Let's move on to impeachment. I'm going to call it a circus. The only harm that I may be doing to the president is I want him impeached. I would, uh, I would, I would support impeachment. I think that, um, you know, we have the grounds to do it. Because we're going to go in there, we're going to impeach the mother. Exactly. I think we are at the, essentially in the beginning of an impeachment process. I think that there is uh, a lot of momentum towards an impeachment inquiry. Yes, exactly what I feel. Uh, I think we've already begun it. We have to get ready for impeachment with this president. The time has come, Mr. Speaker, for the House of Representatives to begin an impeachment inquiry into President Trump. It's time for us to impeach this president. I'm so proud of the work of Chairman Adam Schiff. I certainly said that there's ample evidence of collusion. There is circumstantial evidence of collusion. But look, you can see evidence in plain sight uh, on the issue of collusion, pretty compelling evidence. Adam Schiff came on and he went full Alice in Wonderland, Queen of Hearts. Verdict first, trial later. I believe he destroyed his credibility. Top Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee under fire tonight for reciting what he later called a parody of President Trump's phone call with the Ukrainian president. And I'm going to say this only seven times, so you better listen good. I want you to make up dirt on my political opponent. Understand lots of it. Not the words in the transcript. Well, they, they are works of fiction, uh, Judge. What we have is Adam Schiff, not once, but dozens of times, making up fictional narratives. This call was perfect, and I think the facts bear him out. It's one of the reasons, two reasons Nancy Pelosi sh slow walked this. One was to find more evidence, okay, because they didn't have it. And they're afraid that guns are going to be turned back on them for a weak case. The second was to make sure she could Bigfoot President Trump's State of the Union message. That's why she slow walked this entire thing. They're asking you not only to overturn the results of the last election. This is a purely partisan impeachment. There have been 17 witnesses. They're asking you to remove President Trump from the ballot in an election that's occurring in approximately nine months. Uh, first off, have you heard from the whistleblower? Um, are you, do you want to hear from the whistleblower? Uh, we have not spoken directly with the whistleblower. Uh, we would like to. The New York Times writes, House Intelligence Chairman Adam Schiff received an early account of the accusations against the president before the official whistleblower complaint was filed. This puts him in some, in some trouble. Uh, he clearly uh, wasn't being forthright uh, in that interview with us a couple weeks ago. When they hit us, we have to hit back. I feel that. I mean, there's two ways of doing it, turning your cheek, but I wouldn't be sitting up here if I turned my cheek. It's really bad, but we're winning, and we're winning. Not easy, but we're winning. A lot of dirty people. A lot of very bad people. A lot of bad people, and I think, I think justice will be had. I do believe that, or I wouldn't be very happy right now. Is anybody going to be locked up for this? I mean, it's only the biggest political scandal. Where, where's the bracelets? Where's the handcuffs? My gosh. <laughs> right? My gosh. Only the biggest scandal of our time. <laughs> yes. So I can tell you, I can tell you this, and I get this question where I go all over the country. I get this question every single day, whether it's in an airport or speaking to a large group. And here's what I will tell you guys. Obviously, the person that really wants people held accountable, the number one person in America that wants people held accountable, is the President of the United States. But I will tell you this, the second person in this country that wants these people 
handled appropriately is sitting right here, me. They were going to try and overthrow the government of the United States, a duly elected president. And if I didn't fire James Comey, we would have never found this stuff. Because when I fired that sleazebag, all hell broke out. They were ratting on each other. They were running for the hills. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. It's in the hands of some very talented people. We're going to have to see what happens. But I can tell you, in my opinion, these are the crookedest, most dishonest, dirtiest people I've ever seen. Now, everything that we've been watching in the economy is not by coincidence. Earlier today, the Federal Open Market Committee announced a one half percentage point reduction in the target range for the federal funds rate, bringing that range to one to one and a quarter percent. My colleagues and I took this action to help the U.S. economy keep strong in the face of new risks to the economic outlook. Uh, we have moved to a more adverse scenario with the uh, coronavirus spreading now in 75 countries and uh, the impact uh, of the virus already being felt in the uh, economy. Now we know that Trump and the Patriots, they have been building the transitional economy. This is being built in parallel to the central bank system. The USMCA is the first U.S. free trade agreement with an entire chapter devoted to digital trade, and the tech industry hopes it'll be a framework for future deals. It seems like it's all part of the same thing, but it really isn't. The central bank system is not based on jobs. It's not based on higher wages. It's not based on manufacturing. So Trump, he is building this new system, and actually, this new system is becoming stronger and stronger every single day. Under a globalist model, you cannot bring back more jobs because that wasn't the plan. Trump's plan is completely different. It's not following the central bank rules. It's not following the globalist rules. He is following his own rules. That, wow, a lot of these companies, they are now moving out of China maybe back into the U.S. Everything that we see happening with the market in flux, which we know why this is in flux, with the supply chains being altered, with the news being very upset with what's going on, with them reporting that there's a recession coming, this is a huge transitional pivot we are now transitioning into a new system. Remember, the central bank system is going to be going into recession. It's going to, into go, it's going to be going into a global depression. That's what the mainstream media is talking about. That's what they want to crash. Trump wants to keep that economic system continually chugging along long enough to complete the new economic system. Trump is the first U.S. president to attend Davos in 18 years. Though he belittled the forum and delegates during his election campaign as elite globalists, his tone was different on Thursday. Very exciting to be here. We're very happy to be here. The world is witnessing the resurgence of a strong and prosperous America. The president came here two years yep. ago. There were some raised eyebrows. Yes. Who was this guy? What's he doing? He was, he was a a mega media star back then, the crowds that followed him here. America is open for business and we are competitive once again. But he's back here and what did you say? Andrew said he's being embraced, I embraced being by embraced the media. and called the new Davos man. America's newfound prosperity is undeniable, unprecedented and unmatched anywhere in the world. America achieved this stunning turnaround 
not by making minor changes to a handful of policies, but by adopting a whole new approach centered entirely on the well-being of the American worker. Because the construct of what it used to be to be a Davos man, of the this New York idea, Times, Larry, of multilateral negotiations, of everything being, and he sort of turned the whole thing on its head. And I think there was an expectation two or three years ago here that it wasn't going to work. Right. We are determined to create the highest standard of living that anyone can imagine. And right now, that's what we're doing for our workers, the highest in the world. And we're determined to ensure that the working and middle class reap the largest gains. A nation's highest duty is to its own citizens. What a prominent role the president is playing in international affairs, not just foreign policy, but trade policy. I believe that for the global economy to actually function well, it needs to be able to rely on a more open, more stable, more transparent, more predictable and rules-based international trade system. If we have the right policies and incentives, uh, we can then create the momentum for the tremendous liquidity we have in the world that is sitting idle. There, there is a proposal by the IMF to turn the SDR into a um, into the reserve currency per se. Um, I'm kind of against it because the IMF is, to me, a very questionable organization. It has been bribed before. And uh, as such, it will be essential for the US and all its trading partners. In fact, unfair trade is perhaps the single biggest reason that I decided to run for president. Including the likes of China, Mexico and others. To agree on a new system. But unlike so many who came before me, I keep my promises. We did our job. To agree to eliminate the distortions that put a break on growth. Today, I urge other nations to follow our example and liberate your citizens from the crushing weight of bureaucracy. With that, you have to run your own countries the way you want. Now, folks said he was an isolationist and so forth and so on. The reality is we've cut huge trade deals, one in China, one in North America, one in South Korea, one in Japan, we're still working on the EU. In fact, I will be in the bilateral with the new president of the EU and President Trump. So he has been very prominent in international affairs. What is Interledger's total addressable market size? All the money. <laughs> nobody wanted to. Nobody wanted to feed it. Um, yeah, it's all the money because what we're really talking about with this idea of the Internet of Value is creating a single global payment network. You know that idea of the boom bust cycle is, and that that history that we've been in for decades is really driven by shifts in credit and monetary policy. But you're in a situation now where the Fed is in a box. They can't tighten and they can't ease, and nor can other central banks, particularly the reserve currencies. Sparky00618 wants to know, how will digital currencies and the shift in the global banking system affect Vanguard? In Japan, almost every bank is starting to work with something called XRP, or you may know it as Ripple. Yeah, it was a very exciting time. Uh, so much change going on. And one of those additional changes that I think will be part of this fourth industrial revolution mm -hmm. is this notion that we now have this internet of value. Uh, we're moving into a world where value, money, mm -hmm. payments is moving like information already does on the, on the internet. Mm -hmm. And that's a big deal. I would say revolutionizing international finance is not something that you would expect to happen overnight. As the president has said, and 
I wholeheartedly agree. The best is yet to come, folks. Well, it's about, uh, it's about having a technology that, uh, that cuts across borders and that can help cut the, the cost and, uh, and, uh, and improve the speed of cross-border mm. payments, which everyone agrees now uh, are too slow and too, and too costly. Where do you go from here? It's not going to look like it has. So we kind of found ourselves in this situation where if we wanted institutions to settle their international payments with a digital asset, we first had to rebuild the payment messaging, sort of the plumbing. So I would say the, the top priority for the global community is not about CBDC. CBDC will come in, so central bank digital currency, it will come in due course in different ways and right. we're, we're working on it. But the top urgent priority is to improve uh, cross-border payments, in particular for uh, low-income and developing economies, because that's a matter of financial inclusion and that's a matter right. of growth for the global economy. So fintech should focus on what is actually transforming mm -hmm. and then partner with the financial institutions so they keep doing what they're doing, and that's a win-win. And I firmly believe that that's how this is going to have the most impact. But I do think we're already seeing language coming out of um, the Treasury that highlights the importance of um, a stable international monetary system. And I think that's new language, and I think that's reflecting the priorities of this administration. We are creating an economic opportunity for all Americans that will allow you to seize your dreams. We're not gonna be able to provide them, but we can create the playing field that enables you to realize your success. You don't really want a, a weak dollar or a strong dollar, you want a dependable dollar. And um, I think that's what what he understands at a gut level. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping to see policy initiatives in conformance with that. It's, it's, uh, it's a diff difficult argument to make in a world that has become used to having currencies not having any rules. Every day I will not rest, I will not stop, I will never give up until we've delivered equal and abundant opportunity to every neighborhood all across our land. Together we will bring hope to every family, justice to every citizen, and pride to every loyal American heart. Because of your courage and your devotion, we will make America stronger and safer and prouder and freer and greater than it ever was before. I like the idea of a gold standard. I mean, it could be used in a very um, cryptocurrency way. The point is, do you have a unified money system so that when you talk about the international marketplace, everyone is playing on a level monetary playing field? Bottom line is, this is the beginning of an internet of value, where value will be able to move like information, where it will move instantly, uh, basically for free, as a free infrastructure, uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, that now provides access to people, whether they're in, uh, you know, in uh, growing economies in Africa mm -hmm. or in the rich countries uh, in Europe and the U.S. Uh, or in China. Um, it will give them uh, more value that they can use for their families. The digital payment systems that we have and that exist, you know, we have several items that are completely digitalized that are not at the, at the front end and that you know the, 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 the bank's clients do not perceive as being in operation but where settlement and clearings are actually taking place instantly thanks to the digital payment system that have been put in place notably within the euro system so on, on those digital euro system that exist some of which need a, a better take up by some of the of the members of the system, uh, I will continue to push because I think we have something which is which is really worth uh, developing and encouraging. And I'm talking here about TIPS and PEPS and all those acronyms that I should not be using, but I don't know what they stand for. All I know is that they deliver in digital terms the operations of clearing and settling, sometimes in one single operation. Space and see fire fly. Yes, I'm looking at the bonfire guy. <laughs>